Warm greetings to everyone from NetStrat. Continuing with our episodes on geopolitical and security matters. Today, in the NetStrat studio, we have the most distinguished, erudite, legendary, and illustrious police officer of India, Shri Prakash Singh. We are very privileged to have him here to discuss the internal security challenges that is being faced by India, the wide spectrum. Shri Prakash Singh does not need really any introduction. He is an author of nearly 10 books, few are on display here, the most recent being Unforgettable Chapters, that is the excerpts from his autobiography, with long glorious innings. He is a Padma Shri, the government decorated him with this rare honor among the police officer. Most significantly, he held the charges of the Director General of Police of the most popular, populous state, Uttar Pradesh. Also, he was DG Assam. And I should mention he was Director General of the Border Security Force. And on a personal note, he was my first DIG in 1978 in Merit. So, besides the personal chemistry I have with him, the functional rapport, I'm greatly inspired by his work. He was also in the advisory board, the National Security Advisory Board. He's in the advisory board of many institutions. He's a prolific writer. He lectures into various police and security related institutes. And above all, he has been an architect of the police reforms in India. And that I will give him the space and the floor to discuss that. And I think, sir, with your permission, let that be the first point. You can enlighten our viewers about the police reforms and where is the hiatus? Where is it stuck? Why is it not being enforced, sir? You see, I thought of taking up the issue of police reforms uh, after retirement because uh, throughout my service, I felt that uh, even when you are trying to enforce the rule of law, there are, there are obstacles and people uh, don't let you function. And in fact, uh, if you um, sort of um, run foul with the politicians, uh, you are likely to be axed and uh, disgraced. So, I mean, I felt that there's something seriously wrong with the system of policing that we have in the country uh, because a, a, an officer who is uh, who is trying to function conscientiously and trying to genuinely uh, enforce the rule of law. Why does he encounter so many problems and difficulties? Uh, I mean, this question kept on agitating me. And so I, I said that some basic institutional reforms are called for. But what are those reforms? So soon after my retirement, I studied all the uh, relevant reports on police, especially the National Police Commission report. And then uh, I prepared, a, you can say, a synopsis of the various recommendations made by different commissions at different periods of time. And uh, I crystallized all those into five or six uh, rec recommendations. And on, the, on that basis, I went to the Supreme Court that these institutional reforms are required in the police uh, so that it functions, uh, as, as I like to say, as a people's police and not as a ruler's police, which it is functioning at present. Uh, my petition was entertained by the Supreme Court. And in the, after 10 years of hearing, uh, they gave a judgment in 2006 uh, in which they gave six directions to the state governments and one to the union government. I won't go into the details of those uh, because that will take a long time. But suffice it to say that uh, these directions were meant to give uh, sort of uh, meant to insulate police from outside pressures, uh, give security of tenure to the director general of police, prescribed a specific procedure for the selection of DGP because otherwise uh, chief ministers tend to select on the basis of their whims and fancies. Uh, then separate investigation from law and order in the metropolitan towns and have a police establishment board to give uh, uh, autonomy to police officers in selecting their officers and their postings. And then a complaints authority to look into complaints of serious misconduct against policemen. These were the objectives of the prayer and these were sort of all accepted by the Supreme Court and they gave directions on all these six points. There was a lot of enthusiasm after the Supreme Court directions came and we thought uh, we'll see a new dawn and uh, we'll 
the CA completely changed their metamorphosis to police. Uh, but uh, that did not happen for the simple reason that uh, the bureaucrats and the politicians felt that here are a set of directions which would uh, more or less free the police from their control. Uh, I would say control, their stranglehold. The control they would still retain, but their stranglehold would be gone. Uh, and they were not prepared for that. So uh, the states um, kept on thinking of what to do, what not to do. Um, and uh, uh, a conference of all the chief secretaries of uh, the country was held. Uh, and there they sort of deliberated on these problems in detail, ostensibly to discuss the implementation of the Supreme Court direction, but in reality to discuss how to get away from that. Now, the Supreme Court directions contained a caveat. It said that um, these directions will hold good till such time as the center of the states implement the directions of the Supreme Court. So, uh, so, the clever states felt that if you legislate, then you are beyond the purview of the Supreme Court uh, monitoring. Sorry to interrupt you, sir. What do you mean by the clever states? Clever states because they said that uh, if we legislate, on the subject as indicated in the judgment, then the Supreme Court monitoring stops okay. because, the, because the Supreme Court can fill a legislative vacuum, yes. but it cannot legislate. So because there was a vacuum, so they issued a set of directions and they said these directions will hold good till such time as you legislate. So they said, all right, we legislate. Now the clever states started legislating and, of, uh, and out of the clever states, I need hardly say Bihar was the first. They may be laggard in other matters, but they were the first to legislate. And the purpose and the motive behind legislation was to uh, give legal cover to the existing arrangement or whatever arrangement they wanted in modification of the existing one to sort of perpetuate their hold over the police. So actually they passed acts and uh, by passing those acts, they said now we are beyond the purview of the Supreme Court's monitoring, but those acts I uh, sanctified or, or you can say regularized the status quo by proper legal enactments. Now 17 states have done, done that and if we examine these acts, we, you, we find that uh, they go against the letter and spirit of Supreme Court's directions. The, re the remaining states passed executive orders but even those uh, uh, flout the directions of the Supreme Court. So the, the, the sum and substance of uh, all the uh, struggle which has followed the judgment is that the states have either passed executive orders or passed separate police, separate and new police acts. And those executive orders, sir, they are in at they are at variance with the Supreme Court orders. No, not, uh, I mean, they give an impression as if you are following the Supreme Court judgment, but if you analyze it minutely, you find that they go against the letter and spirit. Okay. So the, we brought this to the notice of the Supreme Court and there's the, at that state they constituted a Thomas Committee. Justice Thomas was the chairman of that committee to go into the um, follow-up action taken by the state government. Justice Thomas Committee took two years and at the end of it, he also came to the conclusion that we are dismayed. This is what he said, we are dismayed by the total indifference. Sorry. These were the words used by Thomas Committee, by the total indifference of the states to the, uh, in the matter of implementation of Supreme Court directions. So that is the problem. I mean, uh, on paper, they claim to have uh, done something in the implementation of the Supreme Court directions, but in at, at the ground level, it is not reflected. And even on paper, if you analyze it critically, you would find that um, there are very clever deviations. For example, if this, if there's a state security commission, they said uh, the recommendations of the SSC will be binding on the state government. They said, all, uh, all right, we have constituted a state security commission, but its recommendations will be just recommendatory, not binding. Now, once it is not binding, then it is as good as whether you have a commission or not, don't have a commission. So likewise, uh, they have in introduced uh, clauses which completely frustrate the intentions and the, uh, and, and the objectives of the Supreme Court. All right, so what is the way ahead now? Because I've been hearing for a very long time, we had debated, if you kindly recall, in the Indian Police Foundation debates and all. So, how do we break the hiatus? How does it, whether the court will take cognizance? The battle has to be fought on several fronts. Number one, I will say the battle should continue in the Supreme Court. That should continue. Uh, mind you, Supreme Court also 
I mean, goes through periods of inactivity. And for the last four years, they have not taken up the petition. <laughs> but in between, there come judges. We, we have seen judges who take it up with a crusading spirit. And then they give it a lot of push and momentum. There was one Justice Singhvi. He was so sincere about it. He called four chief secretaries of four states before the Supreme Court. And I, I, it was quite a spectacle. I mean, they were all shivering in their pants and uh, they didn't know how to speak. I mean, I mean, I mean for the first time, you felt that here are uh, what what Mao called paper tigers. So very good, yeah. sir. And this is very heartening to hear that yeah. in the judiciary also there are, there are there. people of substance who are supporting this cause, so, the police reforms. This battle has to be continued in the Supreme Court. Yeah. Secondly, I would say this battle should be decentralized and it should be fought at the state high court level also. People can go, and I've been uh, I'm in touch with certain people, and certain people have gone to high court. Uh, that look, uh, these directions were given to, by the Supreme Court to the state governments. The state government of, say, Maharashtra has not implemented, and I'm going to the uh, High Court of uh, Bombay okay. with a contempt petition against. So, if uh, this battle gets decentralized by uh, by uh, motivated people, so whether whether retired police officers or otherwise, then this bat this battle will get decentralized. Okay. Thirdly, a number of NGOs are. Uh, interested in police reforms and they have taken uh, taken it up. I think we need to coordinate the efforts of these NGOs. And, uh, there are several NGOs across the country which have shown interest in police reforms as one of the items which they need to pursue. I think we need to coordinate their efforts. And fourthly, I would say the best uh, way to push this agenda forward would be if police department itself introduces such internal reforms such internal reforms which do not require any political direction, which do not require any financial support, mm. and which can be done by police officers on their own, with their own existing resources. So you mean this should be done at the state level? By, no, by the, by, by the department itself. The department. Because once you introduce these internal reforms, the credibility of the police would improve. Mm. And once the credibility of the police improves, there would be greater popular support for this kind of structural very, reforms. So the viewers, this is a very important point which uh, Mr. Singh is making for implementation of these reforms that the department itself should come forward <laughs> and try to form committees and towards enforcement. Yes, sir. Yes, in fact, the Indian Police Foundation has already set up a, a committee headed by Dr. Ish uh, and uh, they are working on uh, these internal reforms and they are in touch with several state governments also. So, if the internal reforms agenda is pushed by the Police, it's a, some kind of, you can say, in-house reform. Now, one thing is in-house reform. I mean, to give an example, if you can improve the ambience at the police station. Now, a man with a complaint generally is reluctant to go to a police station unless, that, uh, unless he has some support police wale ko janta hai, or, uh, or some DIG or IG rings up, Mr. X is going to police station, please listen to him. Otherwise, a, a common man is generally reluctant to go to the police station. Why can't you improve the ambience Correct. of the police station that Correct. a man feels that yes, I mean, just as you, when you go to a hospital, Mind you, hospital may be good or bad, but when you go to a hospital, you you do have That's this feeling that uh, whatever uh, injury I have you got, feel or, comfortable, uh, you feel at uh, ease. Uh, that is something will be done. Very good. It may not be very useful. It may not be very productive. It may uh, you it may con your suffering may continue for a long period. Yet you go with expectation, a positive feeling. So similarly, a so, man should enter a police station with a positive feeling that my complaint would be listened okay. to, it would be recorded, and that there will be follow up action. Very right. So, on this point, I had already decided that I would raise this question with you. You said very, very pertinent point that the infrastructure, the ambience, the ambience is the word when you go inside, is still after so many years, and you had been the lone crusader, if I may say, towards the direction. Why is this that a first information report is not lodged easily because the complainant is not feeling confident enough in walking into the police station and uh, meeting the concerned police officer and say, Ki, please register this complaint, I've lost my cycle, I've got a passport inquiry to be made. I'm saying, why is the trust deficit still rampant, sir? Will the reforms, if implemented, will you see any improvement towards this? I'm sure it will uh, see improvement because, you see, uh, there are a number of problems. First, let us understand those problems in the registration of the fire. Firstly, these days, unfortunately, I would say uh, Indians have become so litigant that they never go uh, and report the bare facts. They will first go to an advocate, 
दैट दिस इज द प्रॉब्लम आई हैव द एडवोकेट विल गिव दम एडवाइस नहीं सर इसमें ये ये धारा भी लगनी चाहिए सो यू एड दिस इन्फॉर्मेशन ऑल्सो इट मे विट मे बी टोटली फॉल्स सो वी गो विद एग्जैजरेटेड रिपोर्ट्स टू द पुलिस स्टेशन दैट क्रिएट्स प्रॉब्लम फॉर द पुलिस एंड दे रियली डोंट नो वॉट द ट्रूथ इज एंड द प्रॉब्लम इज दैट एट द पोलिटिकल लेवल नो चीफ मिनिस्टर वॉन्ट्स फिगर्स ऑफ क्राइम टू गो अप इन हिज स्टेट दे से भाई डी जी साहब इसको जरा ऐसा मैनेज करिए कि मतलब लगे कि क्राइम अंडर कंट्रोल क्राइम अंडर कंट्रोल है अदरवाइज इन द असेंबली ड्यूरिंग डिस्कशन द पोलिटिकल लीडरशिप वुड बी लिंच एंड दे वुड से साहब अपराध बेकाबू हो गया एंड थिंग्स ऑफ दैट सॉर्ट सो एट पोलिटिकल लेवल देर इज ऑलवेज सम काइंड ऑफ प्रेशर ऑन द पुलिस दैट यू कीप दी फिगर्स अंडर कंट्रोल so i mean these are two main problems uh, but i think it requires uh, some kind of moral courage on the part of police leadership and that's what we have seen in in delhi this was done during busi's time they they reco- there was a lot of uh, free registration of crime and crime figures galloped by 40 to 40 to 60% but there was no public furor so if if one particular leadership could do it uh, i'm sure the others I'm can sure also show the way and, and so, you should be able to face the public you should be able to face the public and you should be able to tell them that look if you want your grievances to be addressed you you should let us register the cases uh, and so, if the numbers in, if the numbers go up that should not lead to any public outcry so therefore we should not according to mr singh and i agree with him we should not lose hope there is still hope that the trust deficit between the police and the common public will be narrowed down in not so distant future so could we now discuss some of the threat bear uh, security challenges facing you i have i've seen your book say which i read and reviewed also long time back on the naxalites the maoism it was naxalizing very well researched book very prescriptive also so we saw a couple of months ago there was an encounter in chatisgarh and according to me as a lay person i find that there is um, a trend a downward trend in the cases of maoist violent acts unlike one saw in datewada in 2010 and all mm-hmm. so what is your understanding of the situation is it going downhill or what is the future of the naxalite movement in india you see if you look statistically yes there is a lot of improvement and government has been boasting that uh, there has been 70% reduction in um, incidents of crime and and it's also a fact that uh, at one time uh, it was in 2010 when mr manmohan singh was the prime minister uh, more than 200 districts were affected but as on date uh, government claims that only 43 districts are affected which is uh, which is so which is surely... which is which is by and large true and uh, which shows that uh, whatever security forces have been I mean, the way they have been operating it has had the desired impact and the number and the the quantum of violence is down the number of districts affected is also less and there is a lot of shrinkage in the in the following of the moves uh there are large scale surrenders which have been taking place <coughs> in different districts especially in the bastar division of chatisgarh all that is happening and all that is true but i think we have to take a long term uh, historical view of the naxalite movement and uh, somehow you see i have been following the naxal movement uh, from its very inception as a young officer uh, when i was serving in the intelligence bureau i was given this naxal desk and since then i i mean i studied it at that time yeah. and some and somehow I felt so interested in the movement that I kept myself abreast of whatever is happening since then and then uh, after retirement I wrote a book also on the Naxalite movement which is uh, well, it's it's slight to going off, uh, beyond the subject but uh, my book on Naxalite movement is available in three countries uh, it was uh, it was translated uh, Yeah, an abridged edition was brought out by the Joint Special Operations University in USA. Yes. Then a French edition came out uh, in France, and according to Balachandran, who was then posted in Paris, yes. it be- it became a bestseller in France. And of course, it has done well in the country also. Right. So you see, the Naxal movement I have seen, and there are two other occasions historically. There were two other occasions in the past when we felt that yes, we have solved the Naxal problem. One was when Charu Mazumdar was arrested in the in the seventies, yes, and he died in police custody, and that followed by that. was followed by splintering of the movement uh, there was a lot of uh, disaffection against the leadership and against what they thought um, the kind of rank slogan
reasons given by the party, like China's chairman is our chairman, uh, or uh, annihilation of class enemies. Africans. They said uh, all these are wrong uh, uh, tactical uh, approaches and wrong slogans. So there was a lot of uh, ideological discussion in the party, and the party was fragmented, and uh, government felt that, yes, now we are uh, done with the Naxal movement. But subsequently, the PWG, the People's War Group, Organized it, Kondapalli uh, Sitaramayya was the brain. And then he's, uh, of course, started from Andhra Pradesh, but it is spread to the neighboring states and again gained a lot of momentum. Now, after Kondapalli was arrested and he also died, then again, government uh, towards the end of the last century felt that I think, uh, I mean, we are done with the Naxal movement and uh, it's we are going to see the end of it. But in 2004, again, the movement resurrected and in a more virulent form. And if you look at it historically, every time the movement resurrects, it it shows greater punch. It shows greater lethality. It shows greater renewed uh, vigor. It shows greater capacity to inflict uh, violence and take on the security forces. Sure. So there have been two such uh, episodes already, and so today uh, the movement is at a low. But uh, uh, will it resurrect again? Mm -hmm. If government, I mean, government should. I, have, I mean, maintain the pressure. government should not only maintain the pressure. Government should now think out of the box and think of. Uh, uh, as I have been arguing through my articles that it is time to heal. There has been enough of bloodletting on the Naxal front and it's time now that you are on top of the situation and now that you can say that uh, they are on the defensive and uh, they are uh, in some kind of a tactical retreat. This is the time when you should make a magnanimous offer that we are offering that you come to the negotiating table and we let us discuss what, are your, what are your problems. Now, I talked to, I sounded to some senior government officers on the subject. They said, no, sir, sir we are waiting for them to uh, come up with. No, whether they will come forward uh, requesting you for peace talks or not. But if you offer, it will be considered magnanimous and they will grab this opportunity because they know they cannot take on the might of the Indian state. Yeah. That will be magnanimous and then you can persuade them to join the mainstream right. on, I mean, after conceding whatever you think are their yes, leg sure, sure. legitimate grievances which would uh, which would be face saving for the leadership during the last 15 years about 3 lakh hectares of forest land have been diverted to non forestry purposes there is a mining project uh, uh, there is a steel project or uh, there is some development project there uh, the forest land has been diverted now what happens to the people living on li living in the in those forest areas right. they get displaced they have nowhere to go Forest is gone. Forest was their source of livelihood. It was part of their daily life. Now they have nowhere to go. And that is the time when Naxal goes and says, all right, you have been displaced. You have nowhere to go. Come on, uh, we will give you respectability. Here is your weapon. And now you go as a Naxal to your village. You will be treated right. well. You will be given free food. You will be given uh, rest in the village. And no, they will not talk about your identity and your movement. Yeah. So the point is, there are so many issues uh, which you can say constitute the uh, root causes, root causes. Uh, then, I mean, talking on the subject, there is a there's world inequality report which says that one percent of the population of India has uh, forty decimal one percent of the national wealth. Now, this inequality <clears throat> by by itself, I mean, inequality generates a feeling of resentment. Why does that man have so much, and why do I have so little? Why do I have to struggle to earn my two meals a day? And whereas he, he, his wealth is increasing at the rate of say four crores per every hour, Correct. so these feelings uh, generate a, some kind of discontentment, and we we need to we need to address the, the basic the, the basic socio-economic causes which leads uh, the poor tribal to join the Naxal ranks. Correct. Once that is addressed, and once we, I mean, we, we should not think of killing these tribals. As I said, they have agreements. That grievance needs to be understood. If you go to the ground, if you talk to the villagers, they will tell you what their problem is. So, we got a very strong statement and a very prescriptive one from Sri Prakash Singh, who is a veteran <coughs> in handling and his book also speaks. So, uh, could we shift now to, uh, you were uh, chief of Assam Police also, Assam DG, and had the Northeast insurgency from very close quarters. So, if you can please shed light for the benefit of our viewers, uh, about the present Northeast situation, the security scenario. Is it under control? Does it have a propensity to uh, multiply in, in the near future? See, Northeast is a very 
complex uh, because you have seven sister states and every state has its own set of problems. Talking generally, you can see, uh, you can say that there are insurgencies, there are ethnic conflicts, uh, there are problem of drugs, there's problem of arms smuggling, there's problem of refugees, all kinds of problems yes. are there in different sure, areas. Sure. If you take, let us take area, area by area, in Nagaland, for example, which is, uh, as they say, the mother of insurgencies in the Northeast, and it has been there since mid-50s, we are witnessing this problem. In fact, I started my career in Nagaland, know, that's, uh, the, and that's how I began. Uh, that's that's the time when I first fam got familiar with the problem in that area, and which is continuing to this day. I mean, they go out of their camps, they move about with weapons, they collect money, they uh, commit extortions. And today, in fact, uh, earlier I used to say that Nagaland has a parallel government. Today, I mean, uh, last time I went, they said, sir, it is not a parallel government. There are half a dozen governments running from here. And every Naga, you pay uh, my, uh, extortion money to one group, then uh, three days later another group comes, uh, another five days later it's another group comes, all. and you are you are paying to half a dozen different groups, each one of them claiming authority over Nagaland, and each, and each one of them claiming to represent the Naga people. So it's a very bad situation, and uh, uh, we should, while enforcing the suspension of agreement, ensure that uh, the Naga rebels don't move out with weapons, they don't collect money, Correct. and they don't recruit people. We are not enforcing uh, these particular clauses because the clauses were not uh, the clauses in the agreement were not very carefully drafted. If they were not carefully drafted, let us uh, make up, let us uh, plug those gaps yeah, today. Plug, plug those gaps today. But if you allow half a dozen governments to function there, then I mean, things, things will continue to drift and uh, f start from getting bad to worse every year. So wow. Nagaland, that is one problem. Now, Manipur has become a more serious problem today. I have seen Manipur from the time, uh, from 60s. I mean, that was one area which was majority of people there are Vaishnavites. And they were, uh, they were very patriotic Indians. I saw them as very patriotic Indians. And while serving in Nagaland, every time I thought of a rest and recuperation, I would go to Imphal. Now, about uh, the recent kuki Mate uh, conflict, you see, the problem uh, was precipitated by a high court order. Now, look, Maitis have a grievance. They say that we were recognized as tribals before the state became a part of the Indian Union. But somehow down the line, this tribal category was uh, taken away. Cookies have a grievance. They say that uh, we are looked upon as encroachers and um, as smugglers and uh, uh, indulging in drug trade and whatnot. Now, both have grievance. Now, both these grievances need to be gone into in depth. At and least. what and to whatever extent it is possible, the matter should be resolved uh, without compromising on the territorial integrity of Manipur. I'm the, I'm absolutely clear that whatever cookies or zomis may not. may ask for, but the territorial integrity no of Manipur must be maintained. Absolutely. Advani ji made the mistake of uh, 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 giving an impression that they would compromise. I only gave an impression, and that was followed by disturbances in Manipur. Secretariat was burned down about. 18 people got killed in police firing and all that happened. So, on Manipur integrity, we should be very clear. But within that integrated Manipur single entity, uh, what, how to address the uh, political uh, uh, grievance of the Kukis and the Zomis, that, that could be looked into. That could be looked into. And Maitis, if they are falling back, if they are falling in, in terms of employment, opportunities because they don't get uh, the benefit of a scheduled tribe. I think that also needs to be looked into. Very good point, sir. Very good point. So, the... Uh, if that is, um, in Nagaland, Manipur, after Mizoram, there is no serious problem except uh, there is a lot of refugees are moving yeah, into uh, Mizoram. Tripura, I mean, LF, NLFT and ATTF, ATT both, both, both are reasonably under control. Right. Other states don't have that sure. problem. And Assam in general, uh, you have, we have had an agreement Ulfa. last last December with the, the pro talk faction so of Ulfa. Ulfa. So, so only only the Parish Barua faction Parish Barua faction, Barua faction remain. But so sheltering in Bangladesh has also been stopped, so it's stifled from everywhere. The North Sea situation is under control in terms very, very stat hard. statistically, but uh, I mean going deep into it, I think Nagaland continues to fester, and Manipur is witnessing turbulence. So, uh, so, so Nagaland the, and remains, Manipur. Uh, Thorn in the flesh. Thorn in the flesh and Manipur requires, um, and, uh, I would say, political wisdom of a very high... A redressal. Uh, we get your point, the political. Now, sir, uh, you were you were headed BSF also and I'd seen you in action as additional DG in 1991 in Punjab. That is calmed down now. I would like to hear some views about the present 
سیکیورٹی سینیریو ان کشمیر ایور سنس آرٹیکل تھری سیونٹی بین ایبروگیٹڈ سے ففتھ آف آگسٹ ٹو تھاؤزینڈ نائنٹین بھی کلیئرلی سی اے ڈاؤن ورڈ ٹرینڈ سے اسٹون پیلٹنگ اینڈ آل آئی مین وٹ ایور وی گیدر فرام اوپن بٹ لاٹ آف امپروومنٹ سو واٹ از دی واٹ از واٹ آر یور تھاٹس اینڈ ویوز آن دی پریزنٹ سیکیورٹی ان کشمیر سر So, I mean, a lot of improvement because government say there is, since the abrogation of Article 370, there's 70% reduction in the uh, incidence of violence. And uh, 2023, they say it, there was zero infiltration. Uh, this is the claim of the army. Stone pelting is no longer heard. There's no stone pelting. So, I mean, overall security situation uh, has improved. But I uh, see sporadic incidents continue to happen. And Do Pakistan and Pakistan has not given up its game. Shakespeare has said the leopard will not change its, cannot change its, its spots. So they will continue in this kind of mischief and that has to be taken care of because uh, even stray, uh, stray incidents of um, targeted killings of certain groups of people creates panic among those, uh, panic in that group. And that leads to a lot of concern from the security point of view. So sporadic incidents continue to happen that will need to be looked into. And, uh, Uh, most importantly, I think uh, popular government should be restored and the sooner it is done, the better. I think government is already on track uh, on that front also. And the, the popular government should be restored and uh, Kashmir should be given full statehood. I, I Frankly, I, I feel that it was wrong to have degraded uh, that to a union territory. I mean, at abrogation of Article 370 was fine, but what, where was the need to uh, degrade the state? I mean, uh, it was like adding insult to injury. So, uh, the, the sooner uh, the people of Kashmir get a full-fledged state, uh, the better it would be. And the f- sooner the popular government is uh, installed, that is also, that will also But be good. But it is peaceful, uh, sir. Really recently yes. we held elections. Yes, all the five parliamentary... Trouble con- free, yes. Uh, f- f- five parliamentary constituencies Smoke. you have. And uh, the f- encouraging thing is that uh, polling percentages have been recorded. And I mean, record better, right, than, better than all uh, And any previous year. And also there is a very noticeable influx of tourists also going there. You see and, people are enjoying. And rejection of dead wood. I mean, people yeah. who thought uh, they are great leaders. Mufti has been rejected. Absolutely. Omar Abdullah has been rejected. So I think surely, I mean, there is some something new, something is happening uh, in Kashmir. And uh, given this, uh, once they get the democratic opportunity to... to elect their uh, representative. I'm sure good young so, people. The hopes are there. I mean, yes. you are hopeful as a uh, wonderful, so sir. Wonderful. That That is very reassuring, sir, to hear from you. Now we are coming towards the end, sir. And I uh, would like to hear from you uh, any uh, message which you'd like to give to the police leadership of the country to meet the security challenges in terms of priority, sir. Any three points we'd like to, because it's a rare opportunity to have you in our midst and you can air your thoughts. And absolutely precious thoughts, very valuable, sir. Uh, for the leadership, if you want uh, messages, uh, the first message is that uh, you should enforce the rule of law and in the process, if you have to sacrifice your chair, you should be prepared for it. The problem is we have got far too many officers who are willing to oblige the political leadership and in the process uh, uh, they do things which are not strictly legal. In the process you lose the respect of the force, you lose the respect of the people. We need officers today who can tell the leadership that all right, thus far and no further. You have the freedom to lay down the policies. But how those policies would be executed? The details should be left to us and in the day-to-day working there should be no interference. I think police leadership should be very clear on that and the police leaders should be prepared to lose their jobs if necessary. After all, look, if uh, my point is this. Supposing that you you have 10 officers, 10 senior officers, yes. uh, according to the gradation list, and they all make up their mind. Now, where does the government go? They are not going. doable. Huh, uh, they, A, A is removed. All right, B takes the same line. Mm-hmm. B is removed. C takes the same line. Correct. Then you've got to compromise. Correct. You've got to say that, all right, uh, there's no option. These are the officers I have to work with. You can't import somebody from Russia or uh, China to uh, run the police. So it, it, has, it has to be the Indian police service officer. And once the IPS officers senior level, at the senior level decide that, no, we shall not compromise and the rule of law shall be paramount in our mind while uh, in, in our day-to-day functioning. I think that will go a long way in there. That is one. Two, I would say, 
internal reforms about which I have talked. Uh, the police leaders, leaders are conscious about it and they talk about it, but they don't do it. And there are a whole range of uh, matters which can be addressed by police officers themselves. I said you can improve the ambience at the police stations. You can improve the reporting uh, at the police stations. You can argue with the leadership and get more manpower and now woman power, uh, whatever. I mean, more human resource yes. to uh, fill up the vacancies. In fact, uh, the the, san the present sanctions were done maybe 10 years back or 15 years back. You should say that since then, population has increased, the vehicles have increased. Uh, so, we need, uh, uh, so the, we need more manpower. There. Sure. So, uh, I think uh, capacity building of police, capacity. they should uh, concentrate right. on that capacity, capacity and um, point, once you have, once your capacity building uh, increases, you have uh, uh, your, your, capa your capacity to satisfy people, uh, that also increases. And so, credibility also And credibility up. also goes. That is two. And three, I find that uh, there is a huge gap between the officers and the men today. I mean, I have seen this force uh, from uh, from uh, 59 onwards. I mean, uh, we looked upon the, the, for, the force personnel as our children. Uh, we have to look after them. We have to look after their interests. We have to look after their welfare. We have to look, fight for their rights. Many officers, uh, I mean, the majority of officers, I, I'm sorry to say, uh, they are bothered about their own survival, how to uh, hold on to yeah. the chair of DGP. Uh, of course, um, I have put, I have got my name on the board, but how to hold on to this chair for as long as I, uh, as long as possible. No, you should, uh, you should not have, uh, you should not get glued to a chair Good. and you should be always ready to sacrifice in um, uh, if, um, looking after the welfare of your men and um, sort of uh, br bridging the hiatus between you and the force personnel. That is very important because uh, this hiatus is increasing and uh, officers tend to sort of feather their own nest rather than look after the personnel right. under their command. I think these three directions, uh, these, three this, very relevant, these three sir. advice to the leadership. Thank you very much for this and because this is, these are all doable. Yes. So, Viewers, uh, I must thank uh, Mr. Prakash Singh for his valuable time and more so his valuable suggestions, observations which are very relevant today, whether it is in the Northeast, whether it is in the next slide prone areas, in Kashmir, the reforms and the implications of the reforms, how to improve. It's not that he made statements, he gave solutions also, prescription also, which are very valuable to and I express my thanks. Heartfelt thanks and gratitude to you, sir, you. for you. sparing your time here and uh, in, uh, with us and sharing most, most significant and important doable thoughts with our viewers. Thank you once again, Thank sir. You. Thank you very much.